you know, as a contractor, you know, you're you're making three percent on a you know two hundred million dollar deal, as opposed to the developer making twenty percent. <laughs> so you start looking at that money, and you're like, oh my god, this this you know math it would be better if I was on that side of the table. But Don, you know, I've been knowing for so long. Um, back when I was in college. And so Don had said to me for many years, like, you know, I really want you to come in on the development side. And so Affirmation Tower is one of the projects um, where he said, this is a good opportunity for you to be a partner in the development. Money, it comes with a lot of questions and Fidelity can help you get answers. Visit fidelity.com slash black wealth to learn more. My graduates from my school being Forbes. Bag drop. Bag drop. <laughs> F- a mic drop. Bag drop. Bag drop. All right, guys, welcome back. Yeah. EYL, we back home. And we got an exciting, informational, powerful episode today. Yeah, this is big. This is big. When we talk about generational wealth and sustainable wealth, I don't think it gets any bigger than this. Yeah, so <laughs> Cheryl McKissick Daniel um, is fifth generation. So it's interesting because a lot of times, you know, unfortunately, we're first generation. Yeah. Like starting businesses is the first person in the family to ever start a business. And, you know, there's a lot of trials and tribulations that come with that. There's trials that come with any any level of business, but especially the first people to start it, there's so many different challenges. We just spoke about, like, you know, not having enough money, mm-hmm. not having mentorship, not having the education. And unfortunately, that's one of the reasons why a lot of businesses fail. Um, but, you know, that's not all to the story. Um, there are some businesses that have generations of success and have been passed down generations. And not only white businesses, black businesses as well. Mm-hmm. So um, Cheryl, fifth generation, I believe the largest black owned construction company in America. Mm-hmm. And it's a fifth generation business. Largest and oldest. Yes. It was, <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Um, and uh, currently has 150 employees, uh, more than $50 billion of construction in the past decade. Uh, I saw LaGuardia Airport. Yes. Mm-hmm. JFK as well? JFK. We want to thank you personally for that. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, no. <laughs> right? It's so much better. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. Especially LaGuardia. I was like, this can't be the best city on earth and when they land here they're gonna look at this so thank you yes. thank you um harlem hospital um so much the fulton uh, fish market uh the mart on 125th street um atlantic yards uh columbia university if you're from new york you're familiar with everything that i'm just naming so you know have done a lot of construction as i said fifth generation um and still standing and still, you know, one of the top, not only black owned company, but one of the top construction companies, period, mm-hmm. in America, a very impressive feat. And uh, working with our friend, Don Peeble. Friend of the show. Yes. yes, yes. <laughs> On uh, Affirmation Tower. Yes. We've covered that several different times. So I'm sure you guys are familiar with that right now. So, um, you know, it's important to highlight these stories because I feel like, you know, too often we don't know people like you. Even Robert Smith, when we when we spoke to Robert Smith, I was telling him, like, he's gaining a lot of recognition now. But I remember a couple of years ago, nobody knew who he was. Right. And at that time, he was the richest black person in America. So it's just mind boggling that, you know, we always know the athletes. We always know the entertainers. Yeah. But a lot of times we don't know who the entrepreneurs are. And those are the most important people. Yeah. Um, yeah, and even Robert's story, he's. I mean, obviously, he's accumulated so much wealth and is obviously giving back, but he's first generation. Whereas you're, yeah. you're fifth, and you've created a company a lot of times when we said we, we lack the mentorship, we lack the education, but we lack the scalability. Mm-hmm. And so that's something that you and your family have mastered, mm-hmm. and it doesn't stop here. The sixth generation is next. <laughs> yeah. Sixth generation we're into, is We're getting to it. We're getting to it. So I'm sure she's carrying on the baton. So, but first and foremost, thank you for joining us. Appreciate it. My pleasure. I'm so glad to be here. Thank you. For sure. So I want to get into a lot of the technical aspects of it. But before I do, I want to get the backstory. I think it's people are important to understand. Can you tell us a story of how the company started and how it was passed down from generation to generation? Yeah, absolutely. As you said, we are fifth generation. Goes back 230 years in this country. 
Uh, the first descendant of our family came here in 1790 as a slave and taught the trade of making bricks. Um, that was Moses McKissick the uh, first. His slave master was a contractor named William McKissick. That's why we have the Irish name. Mm. Uh, and um, his son, Moses McKissick the second, was a master carpenter, and he was known for building the Maxwell House Hotel, which is in downtown, downtown Nashville. But he also moved our family to a place called Spring Hill, Tennessee. And in Spring Hill, Tennessee, there's a mansion called the Cheers Mansion. Well, he donated all the bricks for the Cheers family to build that mansion. And that mansion is still standing and it was bought by Saturn Corporation. Uh, and so that's pretty much preserved the mansion all of these years. And of course, they bought acres because they have um, a car plant, manufacturing plant down there. I bring that up because recently the last of the McKissick bricks were stolen. No. <laughs> I'm like, I didn't even get one. Uh, <laughs> and that was my great grandfather's. It was, they were his bricks. Um, Moses McKissick the third uh, was the first black licensed architect with Calvin McKissick, his brother, first black licensed architect in the country. And they incorporated our business in 1905 in Nashville, Tennessee. Now, just think about that. Uh, the Ku Klux Klan started in Pulaski, Tennessee, 50 miles from Nashville. And for these two black men, to not only uh, start a business, but then 15 years into their business, they had to get architectural license to stay in business. So that is a whole story in this, itself. This is a, this is a motion, motion picture. <laughs> it's a motion picture. Two black men coming you know, to the state board to say they wanna take their exam. They were denied over and over again. And finally, one board member said, listen, let's let them take it. They're not going to pass. And of course, they did on the first try. But they eventually got their license. And uh, because they were the first black license in the country, the board got a lot of notoriety. And they went to bat for them to get licensed in 22 other states. And they worked in Haiti with Papa Doc, um, all up through the north, all the way to New York you will see the cornerstone of McKissick and McKissick that was built by my grandfather. And then the company was passed down to my father, who was William McKissick, again, an architect. He had an architectural business, a general contracting business. He did a little bit of development. And he's the reason that uh, my, me and my two sisters are all architects or engineers. He used to tell us all the time, like, you can go to school anywhere you want to go to school. But the only school I'm paying for is Howard University, and you're getting an architectural degree. Me so, too. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, he, he loved his HBCUs. And, you know, I have to tell you, that was just like a great experience. Howard taught us what it meant to be black in America. So I highly recommend HBCUs. We had the best and the brightest that would come to our university and speak to us, whether we understood it or not. Um, you know, Amaya Angelou, um, you know, every president that, you know, was in office comes to uh, Howard University. And of course now the vice president has even made our college even more notable. Um, but Howard taught us a lot about being black and being comfortable with being black in a white world. And then the company uh, passed down to my mother when my father had a massive stroke. Uh, she took over. This she, is at your graduation, right? Like Right, right before my graduation, yeah. four days before we graduated, my twin sister and I from Howard, my father had a massive stroke. Um, we didn't walk for graduation. We had to go home and, you know, uh, help our mother and pray for our father, <laughs> uh, who eventually, you know, got out the ho hospital, but he couldn't speak. He was paralyzed on on one side. So my mother took over the business after being a housewife mm -hmm. and a school teacher. But she did have a master's degree in psychology. 
And I used to say all the time that, you know, she could understand the manias and the phobias of people who couldn't understand how a black woman was going to run this business because she, I mean, over and over again was, um, asked to sell the business because you're a woman, you can't do it. You're not an architect, you can't do it. And she didn't. And she didn't because she said she was going to hold on to it for the next generation. Um, and so that's our family story. Um, my mother called up my boss when I was working at Turner Construction and, and told my boss she's quitting today and coming to work for me. And then she called me and told me to pack up my stuff and come to Nashville. I'm like, what? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and you know, I was a little taken back then, but now I know that was the best decision that ever happened to me. And I'm actually doing the same thing to my daughter right now. Like you're out of LA. I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, you live, you live in LA? She's in LA. She graduated from George Washington and she went out to LA to, to live the LA dream. And, um, it's not going well. So, <laughs> not the way I think it not, should go. Not the way you thought it would. <laughs> For context. So, so I'm, I'm imagining, right? There's a, there's a lot to unpack there. First thing is, I mean, you grew up around architect. Did you ever think that you want to do anything else? It's kind of that ultimatum that your dad gave to you. That I feel like did that stick with you when you you were having children? Like, look, this is the business, and you're gonna run a bit. Y'all can do anything you want, but y'all gonna come back to this business. I never thought I had the personality of an architect or engineer. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I'm just very gargarious and outgoing. You know, I, I thought I would do something like an airline stewardess or <laughs> <laughs> a flight attendant so I could travel the world. Uh, but it was a different day. You know, we didn't have choices. You know, your parents really guided you where you're going to go. And it, it was hard to say no. Mm -hmm. um, so... It's the type of thing where you do what your parents ask you to do with respect to education. Um, and you put your dreams and desires to the side. Mm -hmm. Like, I can always come back to this. And what? Now I fly everywhere. Yeah. <laughs> Whenever I want. So that's, it's like. <laughs> that's a fact. <laughs> right? And, I, and I'm not serving people on the plane. <laughs> but that's. I had that dream. I was going to do that. Um and so it's fine. It's fine. I understand that. And, you know, that's sometimes, I don't know if it's a mistake, but our kids are being raised on the internet. Like I thought if I raised my kids and provided the right model and they saw me get up every day and go to work and explain to them what I do and call them presidents, that it would matter. But it doesn't mm. because I'm at work, they're on the internet. <laughs> Um, and so there's this instant gratification out there. That's a lie. That's a lie out there that <laughs> it's being perpetuated to our kids over and over again. And it's not about hard work. It's putting on something that makes you look good to get noticed. You know, it's, you know, if, unless you, you know, really are a great artist or a great athlete, it's very hard to make it in those areas. Um, so you know, the, the narrative, I think, is not very positive for our kids if we want them to go into business. And I, I see that in my own kids. Yeah, a few guys might be uh, trying to change the narrative a little bit. I mean. <laughs> yeah, thank you. I've seen that. I see that. I watched the Steve Harvey today. <laughs> Appreciate it. Classic episode. Shout out to SH. Um, so let me ask you this. Let's unpack this a little bit. So five generations, it was passed down to. So there has to be some level, I'm assuming, of planning in place to, because there's other family members involved, right? So there's no other family? Like, I mean, like, so it's like, how does it, is, is it like, is a written document in place? Or, or is it like, okay, this is what's going to happen? No, it's just all through word of mouth and understanding? <laughs> I think that's been the downfall of a lot of businesses. If you think about first generation that, that make it to the second generation, that's like 40%. The third generation going, the second generation going to the third generation is like less than 4%. Mm. And then this is, you know, fifth generation. And, you know, while my father may have had a plan, he didn't write it down for me. <laughs> he didn't tell me this is our official succession plan. 
Um, yeah, succession plan. That's what I was looking for. Yeah. Plan. Yeah, I got you. And, um, you know, that's something very important for us as black businesses because succession is coming whether we want it or not. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's better to plan for it. And, you know, if I look eight years out into the future, I, I may not want to be doing this right, you know, to the level that I'm doing it right now. Um, so to do that, you've got to deal with succession. And it's interesting that you ask, like, how did this happen? Because I'm not sure my father got a plan from my grandfather. <laughs> um, and so, you know, a lot of it, I think, is paying it forward. It's what I call good karma. Um, my grandfather and his brother used to build black churches at cost. You know, they didn't make money off of it. You know, they were charitable in the community. Um, and, you know, a lot of that good uh, karma and political will, I think, created to a lot of our longevity. So it hasn't been a succession plan. It hasn't been. Do you have a succession plan? I have a succession plan. <laughs> I'm working my succession plan <laughs> right now. <laughs> It's in LA. <laughs> so speaking of succession, most people have heard the word probably by watching the HBO show. And if they watch it, they know the dynamics of the father and he's trying to have a succession plan, but he has two sons and he has a daughter. But he's very hesitant to give it to his daughter. And obviously this is a female run business. So what what what's that been like from your mom down to you and now obviously hopefully down to your daughters? What has that been like? Some of the challenges that you saw your mom face and that, you know, some that you're facing now. Um, well, my mom was, was very, is very strong. She's like a force of nature. Um, and she taught me a lot about business development. She taught me a lot about, um, being comfortable with who I am, no matter where I am. Um, which is kind of hard to do if you're sitting in a room with 50 white men <laughs> you're, and you know, they're talking and you have a female voice and you're like, Hey, Hey, and they don't hear what you're saying. No, mom's like, no, take your papers and throw them down the whole boardroom table to get people's attention. Yeah. <laughs> and then you can talk soft, <laughs> but they, you have to get their attention. Um, I'll never forget mom. Um, when I first started working with her, we would get on the road and we would drive all through the South to our projects, to clients, to new clients. And so a lot of times she would she would insisted on doing all the driving and I would write all the thank you notes coming back because this is, you know, this is carbon paper. <laughs> this yeah. is we didn't have Xerox machines. <laughs> Hand to hand uh, business. <laughs> right. So, but guess what? I learned the importance of building those relationships and how to build those relationships, you know, by writing these letters and what to say to people to really get their attention to want to work with McKissick. But now we've been doing this for a couple of months. And mom said, you know what? Today is your day. You're going to go in, you're going to tell this client who McKissick is, and you're going to sell the business. I'm like, it's only been two months. Are you sure? She's like, I'm sure. So we go in to um, meet with this client. He's an old, old white guy. He had like a road map in his face. He's looking down. He doesn't even look up at us. And so mom looks at me like, okay, Cheryl. So I'm scared to death, but I'm more scared of her than I am of him. So I, uh, I, <laughs> Hello, we're Cheryl. I'm Cheryl McKissick and I'm going through everything. He never looks up. So I'm like, this white dude doesn't care about us. So next thing I know, I'm I'm like done and it's completely quiet. And he stands up. He says, come here, little lady. I was scared to death. I thought he's like the big bad wolf. He's going <laughs> to bite me or something. <laughs> and he shakes my hand. He's like, I really want to do business with McKissick. And I'm like, oh, my God, I didn't think he was paying attention. But that taught me that it doesn't matter who I'm talking to. I'm going to tell you who I am because I don't know how you're receiving it or whether you're receiving it. But you might really be receiving what I'm saying. And maybe that's the way you are. You're, you know, maybe an introvert. You're not as engaging as other people. Um, so I, I do that all the time now. And, but it's hard to do when you are first starting out in business, you don't feel worthy, 
You don't have it all together. It's a little bit of smoke and mirrors. <laughs> yeah. You still have to toot your own horn because if you don't do it, no one else will. Well, let me ask you this. So, all right, when you took the business over, how how were you able to scale it to where it is now? We talked about, you know, all the developments that you've done and over the last, so I'm assuming that, you know, you you took the business to new heights when you took over, over the course of the time. So what are some of the things you implemented with some of the best practices, with some of the collaborations that you've done to take it to the next level? Well, I didn't expect for it to happen overnight. I did think it was going to take 20 years, but no, it took 30 years. Mm. <laughs> um, my strategy, because construction is very complicated in New York, it's very risky. Uh, so my strategy was to work with very large contractors, form a st strategic alliance with them, and then have only three clients in New York City. And those three clients were the New York City School Construction Authority, the Dormitory Authority, and the Port Authority. Why those? They had the largest budgets. <laughs> 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 but it also, if if you focus, you know, you can't be a scatter, you can't scatter your resources out because you won't have enough. So my strategy was just to focus on the main two or three clients and I do that every day of my life. What are the one or two things I have to do today? And that's what I do. Instead of letting all the little stuff get in the way, I focus on the one or two things that are going to make the biggest difference. So that's what I did with these clients. And from there, I understood how to deal with, you know, the New York system, which is navigating the system in New York is no joke. You know, from permitting, um, you know, just getting MWBE certified, all of that takes a lot of time. Um, so I develop these clients. I start off as a sub consultant and then I work my way up to a, a joint venture partner with other construction managers. What, what's the job of a sub, sub consultant? What, what, what was the role that, that so they So basically, if there's construction management services that have to be done, we, we manage the construction process. So we have superintendents, project managers, estimators. So we do budgets, we keep the schedule, and we make sure everything is operating the schedule out in the field. Mm -hmm. So when you are a sub consultant to a large contractor, you're providing staff in the field to perform some of these services. And so that's what I would do. But in the meantime, while my staff is working out in the field, I made sure I was at the meetings with the clients because that's how I develop relationships with the clients. Also, this is how I understand how to do business for them. What are their regulations? What softwares do they use? How do you submit your invoices to them? How often do they pay you? <laughs> well, who who does, what's, what's that stream like? Because you have to understand that. This, back in 1991, 92, 93, it was six months to get paid from the city of New York. And you said the three departments were schools, the school department, port authority, and what was the other? The other one was the dormitory authority, which built all of the buildings for the for um, higher ed. Okay. And so that was across the entire state. They they don't do just dormitories. They mm -hmm. build hospitals, um, higher ed, you know, uh, technical centers, data center, everything. They were the like one of the biggest agencies at the time. So then, what happens when you become a joint venture partner to a large contractor, you are now a prime contractor. And so, you know, the contract is between you and joint venture with someone else. So now you really do have a bird's view, bird's eye view of the agency, the people, the business, how to implement the business. And then from there, I went to just McKissick being a prime. So that's why it's such a process. I mean, we can go through a sales cycle that takes us two years to win a project and then another year for it to start. Mm -hmm. So we, nothing is moving quick in construction. We're finishing up a billion dollar hospital at Coney Allen that we won the first year de Blasio became mayor. 
So that's eight years ago. And we are just finishing up. We won't finish until well into 2023. So Eric Adams would have been mayor for two years. So that's, we have a very protracted schedule. It's it's a long cycle. Um, And so when I understood that, you know, it's all about pipeline, getting as much pipeline as I can. I didn't worry about, you know, a lot of people say, oh, I don't have the people. I got to have the people. I'm like, I don't worry about the people because the project's not going to start for about a year, year and a half from now. Mm -hmm. But then I'll have the right people. Um, So it's, Having faith that you can pull it together. <laughs> you've, done, you've done it. <laughs> in, in, in the future, like, you know, bonding, like, okay, that project needs, you know, 80, 90 million dollars of bonding, but I only have 40. Well, by the time it starts, I'll have it. <laughs> so, all right. So let's go into this. So you decide to work with those three departments. Um, What's the process of even getting a relationship with them? Like, do they have to pick you? Because I'm assuming. Oh. All right. So let's take uh, what's one of the departments? Um, school construction. School authority. construction. But let's say Port Authority. So Port Authority, for anybody that doesn't know, they do all the transportation stuff, bridges, tunnels, infrastructure, yeah. all the infrastructure. Right. So I'm assuming and correct me if I'm wrong. They have a bunch of different contractors that are in their network. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. And then they put the RFP out. Right for a, a a bridge that's being built, and then all, all of the all of the people that's in the network, all of the companies submit proposals, and then they pick which proposal they want. Mm-hmm. But how do you even get in the network? Um, okay, so you and, should, and was that correct? What I just said? It's it's pretty much there might be other steps in there. Okay, um, so they have a pre qualification process and. So that's from the very beginning. You you have to pre-qualify. You have to uh, get what's called vindexed in New York, meaning, you know, you don't have any criminal background. You don't have, you know, bankruptcies or, or old taxes or anything like that. So just think about it. You have one, once is a, one is a pre-qualification just to only talk about your experience and, you know, your portfolio of work the number of engineers you have on staff, the number of architects you have on staff, and then they decide to pre-qualify you. That could take six months. Then you have this Vindex that you have to fill out. Um, that that goes a little quicker. And then on top of that, you have the MWBE certification, which tends to lag these days. I mean- That's w- men, women, minority women business enterprise, right? Correct. Correct. And so the business has to be 51% owned by a minority or a woman. And you can get that certification, uh, but it's very intense. I mean, three years of tax returns. You got to prove that you're black. You got to (laughs) prove you're a woman. They have to do a site visit. I mean, it goes on and on and on. Um, And, you know, you can't even get pre qualified or certified in any of these areas, if you haven't done three projects already. So that's another, you know, big hindrance to people who are trying to get certified. Yeah. So the person who's trying to start the construction company has a disadvantage over somebody who, like you who's been established. And this is where having a generation of business is going to help a business like yours over somebody like me who's trying to start. So is it how would somebody who's trying to who has a, a, a construction company get into a position like that? Would, or they... Do they have to go to another area of the country and then come back to a place like New York? What would you suggest? Um, I would suggest trying to do something in the, in the private sector okay. um, and get some experience that way. Um, working as a sub consultant to a contractor who's working, say, at the Port Authority. Mm-hmm. Um, there, there's ways to get three projects under your belt. Um, but again, it's a hindrance. Um, and I say that all the time, you know, like design build is the new one, the new project delivery method in New York City. And every time we evolve to something new that might be better, if it's technology, if it's how we develop, deliver our projects, minorities and women usually get left out of that conversation. 
So right now, design build is is new over the last couple of years with all the agencies that I work for. Um, but to for my staff to attend the Design Build Institute and get certified in Design Build, they have to have already had a Design Build project. <laughs> And so, I mean, and and it's interesting you say that. I think that all the time, like I came to New York with a portfolio of work. What is it like for people who have no portfolio of work? And when I testify before city council, you know, that's what I say, because most of the people who are starting construction companies who want to be in construction, they didn't come with a big portfolio. I came with a big portfolio portfolio and it's still hard mm -hmm. it's it's ridiculous it's a fight every day last week it was a fight <laughs> it yeah. th that hasn't changed um and so i don't know i don't know how i i mean i suggest that you know these companies allow individuals to use their uh their individual experience because maybe you came out of Turner Construction, and you know you've built X number of, of buildings under that umbrella, but now you want to start your own. Yeah, it's like applying for the job, and they tell you you need experience to do it when you're fresh out of college. Well, I was in right. college, that's I why I didn't have the job. <laughs> exactly. Right. So it becomes extremely difficult. You, you said that when you came to New York. So what was that transition like? Because the business starts in Nashville, mom was in Nashville. How did we say all right? We're packing up stuff and we're setting up shop in New York. Obviously, it's the big city. I'm sure right. budgets had a lot to do with it. But what was that transition like? Um, so my parents, we used to do vacations every summer. And one summer we came to New York and my twin sister and I were probably like five or six years old. And, you know, I remember that week just saying, you know, I love the city. When I become an adult and have a professional career, this is where I'm going to work. Mm. And I'm going to work in one of these tall buildings. So I always knew I was coming to New York. Um, after you know doing undergrad at Howard and then grad school at Howard, I didn't apply to work anywhere else but in New York City. So I've been here even before I finished grad school. I started working at an engineering firm in Manhattan. Um, so New York was always my end game, and you know I just love this city. And it's hard for me to work anywhere else because in New York. <laughs> We're doing like 61, 62 billion dollars of construction every every year right now. I mean, during COVID, okay, it dropped down to 50. <laughs> I mean, it is the dollars here are incredible. I'm chasing a project right now, which is Gateway. It's the consultant like me are gonna bring 300 people to a job for 18 years. It's like a swan song. Mm -hmm. Um, and so you don't have that anywhere else in the country. Terminal one, nine and a half billion is the largest uh, airport project in the country. The MTA, where we are independent engineers, we oversee a $54 billion capital program. <laughs> what? I mean, and you, you bump into to, uh, other agencies and private corporate 200 businesses that have um, portfolios that are huge, that are huge, that I haven't even marketed yet. <laughs> and that's New York City. And so it's very hard to leave here, um, even though we've, we're expanding in some other areas of the country. Um, New York is definitely our bread and butter. And I'm, I'm glad I bet on New York over 30 years ago. Um, and still betting on New York. This yeah. place is incredible. If you have a down, if you have a bad job and a down year, the next year in New York will bring you back. That's how big it is. That is a fact. So, all right, <laughs> let me ask you this. Um, Let's go to New York. So, how does the how does the actual financing work? Like you said, it used to be a time where it was a long time to get paid. Like, do they pay you? In stages, do they pay you a lump sum up front and on the completion of the job? Like, how does that actually work as far as you get hired by the city and then when do they actually pay? It depends on what service we're providing. Uh, most of our services are construction management and program management. I would say that's 80% of our 
work. That means we are billing our staff by the hour and we submit a monthly bill for their services. Um, to, like to, the, I, to the city. To the city, to the state. Um, well, whoever we're working for could be a private sector client. Um, we submit our bill and um, it's gotten much better now because of technology, but it's also gotten better because the MWBE community has fought this fight for 30 years to say, we can't sit out here this long. I mean, these agencies have put contractors out of business because of how long it takes to you know, get paid or approve a change order, which means once they approve it, you can get into the pay cycle. Um, and so now, I would say the average is between 45 and 60 days. Um, when we're general contractors, that's different. Then we're, we're billing um, on percentage of the job complete. And we'll do that every month. Um, so the owner will have to agree that, yes, you know, we've completed 20% of the drywall, 100% of whatever else, and say, okay, yeah, let's, we approve this and we'll pay you. Um, so it's gotten much better. Pretty much on a monthly basis than they pay, and it's like a net, a net thirty. Forty-five, sixty. Net sixty. Yeah. So you have to have positive cash flow coming in because even two months in business, that's a long time. That's yeah, long time. or a lot of credit or what have you. So what have you been able to do? Like, do you just keep a lot of cash reserves? Do you have relationships with banks? Because it's important yeah. for people to know that because I feel like that's something, like you said, takes a lot of businesses out waiting to get paid and then it's like you still have your expense you still gotta pay your your employees are not gonna wait 60 days to get paid like you got they want to yeah. get paid on friday hey, those ain't gonna wait either yeah. yeah so um when i first started my business i did not have any money to pay my employees i had a contract i had a couple employees but i had good friends who were on wall street and i went to them and i said listen can you each like give me five thousand dollars and um, I'll pay you back in six months. I'll pay you $6,000. And I got five people to invest in my business. And, you know, I guess I got my first check three months, three months later, and I was able to start paying my employees. And then I had enough money to pay them back in six months. And they all were like, this is terrific. This is a good return on our money. You know, like, can I invest again? I'm like, nope, your <laughs> money is too expensive. But that is discipline. Like when you get paid, you got to look at that check and say, that's not my money. <laughs> that is not my money. Matter of fact, I don't even get a salary out of that. Those dollars go to pay for the expenses of the business. And I worked for someone else on the side while I was starting my business. And that's how I paid my bills. But I, I couldn't pay my bills out of my business. I didn't have enough money. Mm. Um, and then from there, so that was probably the first, you know, influx of cash was, you know, was private from just friends and family. Again, another problem we have with black people. We don't have friends and family that have that kind of money. Um, and then from there, it probably took three years before I could get my first line of credit. Um, my first line of credit was like $200,000. Maybe it was a hundred. I can't remember now. And then it went up to, to 250. And I mean, like you had to like give your firstborn. <laughs> yeah. So what, what, what time frame are we talking about when you're creating this? Is it the eighties? Or nineties. This is now the nineties. Yeah. So I'm, let's, let's talk. Cause I'm, for the people to really get an understanding at the time period, we're talking about black women having your own business. You, I mean, these getting a loan is like almost impossible. At this oh, it's point. ridiculous. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Because can you like walk people through that? Because I feel like even now it's, it's tough, but you're talking about a time where they weren't even. They wouldn't even consider it. Right. It's not even an option. No. Um, let alone if you hadn't even started your business. Right. Um, fortunately, I think we do have some funds that are in New York that are available to contractors um, if they have a contract. They can borrow from the state and then there's some city funds. But we didn't have that back in the 90s. Um, you know, you go to the bank, they want 
you know, three ways out. They want cash. So you, if you want to borrow a hundred thousand cash, you got to have a hundred thousand <laughs> cash. Uh, you got to have contracts that show, you know, you can pay back the, um, the monthly payment installment payments back to the bank. I mean, it's, it's a heavy lift and then assets, you need assets. Um, and so that was very difficult. So finally in Philly, um, I would say by 1995, there was a black banker at Mellon bank. And, you know, I met him through mutual friends and, you know, we started having dinner and, I was telling about my business. And I'm like, you know what I really need? It's just a lot of credit. <laughs> he said, I'm going to make this happen for you. And um, he did. And he gave me my first line of credit that, you know, just kept growing over the years. I, you know, another tip I have is sometimes the smaller banks are better. They take the time to get to know you and understand what the risk is. Um and so that would be my suggestion to people who are looking for lines of credit. Go to the smaller banks where the president mm. is in the bank and you can sit down and talk to them. They tend to have the ability to be flexible as opposed as opposed to the very large banks. Yeah, I, they I, just, I, their rules and regs, forget about it. That, that was something. Shout out to MG, the, the mortgage guy. He actually, when I was going through the home buying process, he said sometimes working with the smaller blanks is beneficial for that reason. There's a little bit more flex flexibility, whereas in the larger banks, it's like, this is what it is. You meet these uh, guidelines or we're not approving you at all. Right. I'm wondering because you said that the, the pay schedule was net 60. And so obviously I'm thinking, do we? how many projects do, are you taking on to offset that, right? Are you, do, you, do you take on maybe two or three projects at a time or how, how do you delegate that? as far as when you're trying to obviously make payroll and make sure that you make money, but you want to have the balance where you don't overdo it and now nothing gets done. That's an art. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's what I was telling you earlier. You know, um, sometimes you just got to lean into it and say, I'm going to be ready when it comes. Because if you miss the opportunity to win a project, it's not coming back around. And that's your pipeline. You got to build a pipeline to show the bank that you have a future and that you're going to be making money past, you know, the next 12 months. Um, and so for me, I just always did all of that at the same time. I would go after my pipeline and I would just keep trying to keep money in the bank to build up my balance sheet so that when the new projects came online that are bigger, that required more staff, I could either increase my line of credit um, or use my own cash to to pay for my staff. So if I start out with two staff people for one job and now I know another job's coming in six months and I need three people for that one. And nine months after that, I need, you know, five more. I'm up to 10 people. <laughs> and now it's all about after that, those 10 people. Uh, Say the 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 cycle or the schedule for a project is 24 to 36 months, then I have to find somewhere to put those people I've brought on so they can have longevity in my company. And that's another thing that it's you gotta like commit to that if you want people, you know, to be dedicated and loyal to you. You gotta figure out how to keep them employed at your company. So let me ask you this. Um in construction. There's always been a couple of, you know, stereotypes. It's like, it's all, it's men dominated. Um, but then like the mafia, there's always rumors <laughs> that the mafia had a stronghold, especially in New York. And um, so, yeah. Any experience with that? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk about it. <laughs> but don't, I, you, you know what? It's, it's changed. I mean, so... You know, a lot of my experience wasn't necessarily with the mafia because, um, you know, back in the day, you just did what you had to. Like, you know, they were do they would handle all the trash, the concrete, and, you know, you just didn't touch that area. Just go ahead and do what you had to do with those folks. Um, but there were coalitions, like in in Harlem, the black coalitions. Where it was like extorting situation? With, yep. 
shaking down projects. Um, yes, we've had a lot of experience. <laughs> Welcome to New York. <laughs> but that but that now has changed and you know it's it's, it's cleaned up a lot. It really has. Um so like the coalition would be like a, a preacher or something like that, and they would like have like pickets and campaigns and then it's like I right, I could get this to stop if you pay me a hundred thousand dollars. I would say they were more like gangs. I wouldn't call them a preacher. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm just saying that was that was the that was they the, show up was, with guns. <laughs> Oh, but, but because I went from my honest, so all right. It's New York City, Chatty. No, 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 no. What I'm saying, a preacher. What I'm saying, a preacher is that was the, that was the gaze of it to make it look like it was something, like, but like then the, the underneath it is yeah. is other elements to it. But yeah. for the public yes. perception, yeah. for the public perception, is like okay, we can do this and we can run on this because this is something that you know is safe. Yeah. People look at it like, okay, this is black power. They're trying to fight for civil rights. It's like what we talk about but, with lobbies. But the underlying theme of it is like extortion. Yeah. Yes. So lobbies, uh, yes. Uh, an extortion is lobby. Where it's like, all right, well, if you want this to stop, so how, how, how it so, but it's, right, it's, so you, it's extortion that you understand because what happens a lot in the black community is white contractors would come in and work and all the workers were New Jersey license plates. You know, the, it didn't look like the community. So these coalitions really came together to say, look, we want to eat off this plate too. This is our neighborhood. You're putting this in our neighborhood. So, you know, once you begin to understand the mentality and, and what, what they're really trying to do, and, and, and we're the ones who really uh, kind of ended all this in Harlem, is we developed a workforce program. And so we would have, we would sit down and meet with all the coalitions and we would tell them on every job in Harlem, we're going to take one from you, one from you, one from you, and we're just going to go, you know, round robin as we're able to bring neighborhood people onto the projects. And that turned out to be very helpful at Harlem Hospital and Mother Claire uh, Depot. Um, the State Plaza, Columbia University, you know, we were able to make sure that the community people were involved. There's a certain level of pride, right? When you build yeah. something and you know it's yours and you know you live in a community and it's yeah. going to be something that's going to help elevate not only the economic opportunity for the community, but more it's going to bring more jobs into it as well. Yeah. No, I sat in our Harlem trailer one day. And I'm like, who are all these people coming in? They were from the ages of 24 to 70. Dress nice, speak English. <laughs> they were all looking for construction jobs. So I asked the assistant, I'm like, what is going on here? Who are these people? She said, oh, they're looking for jobs here, their applications. I'm like, well, how many applications are there? There were 700. 700 applications in a period of like six months. And then I'm like, oh my God, now I understand what's going on in Harlem. You know, these people need to work on these projects. Um, so the president of Harlem Hospital, Dr. Palmer, I went to talk to him. I said, Dr. Palmer, guess what? This is what's going on. He's like, Cheryl, we're going to pay for you to do a workforce program. It's not a lot of money, but if you can get these people to work or in the construction industry, that's what the goal is. And that's how we started our workforce program. And now we've done that in Brooklyn when we worked at the uh, Barclay Arena, because we did all of the uh, rail around the Barclay Arena to make way for the arena, the, the foundation of the arena. And then um, we did it in Queens. In Queens, we had a thousand people sign up looking for jobs in about three weeks. Wow. Uh, and so it's, it's real. Everybody in their, com in their own community, they need to be able to work on these construction sites. So for the construction workers though, union, union and non-union. Okay. So how, cause I know that's a hassle. That's another story as far as the unions even have a lot of pull and a lot of muscle in New York specifically, because I used to work on Park Avenue, so I used to always see like as issues with construction jobs. If unions aren't involved, they can make it hard. Very hard. That's another kind of extortion to play. So mm -hmm. how have you been able to deal with the unions? Or do you work with unions or do you not work with unions? 
So uh, we were a union contractor for many years, meaning we had we signed on with all the unions. Um, but then we realized we didn't really need to do that because that that type of labor can be very intensive. You have to pay every week. You know, the rates change, you know, every couple of months. And I mean, if you, it's just so easy to make a mistake. Um, and so now, you know, we are contractors that will sign a PLA, project labor agreement on a job. If we are general contractors and actually have to hire union labor, um, as opposed to just being in the union, um, because that the liability, the financial liability of being in the union was really, really great. Um, and so now the unions have gotten, um, I would say, a, a lot more flexible in their approach. Um, there are a lot more people of color working in the union and it's not anywhere the, the way it used to be in the 90s and early 2000s is much more amicable. But if you're going to work on a large project in New York, you're definitely going to do it union. Like our airport jobs, our MTA jobs, all those jobs are going to be union. There's no way around that. What, what, why is there no way around it? It's uh, political. <laughs> mm. Well, as usual. Yeah. Pressure. Yeah. But the thing is about the union, I mean, you know, I just want to put this in here. The union, they train their people extremely well. That's what I was going to ask, too. And this is a highly technical business now. And when you're, you know, building in New York City a skyscraper, you want some of the best skilled workers you can have. And you can't get that anywhere else but the union. Um, so there is definitely a role to play, and there's also a positive side to that. Um, and a few bad apples, I believe, have, you know, tainted it from back in the day. But it's not like that anymore. The you, union is very, very flexible. You, you said the word, you know, Shai said the word pressure. So it you know, just dawned on me. Do, do you feel that pressure? Um, obviously, you said things aren't as they once were as far as people that look like us in the construction business, obviously in, in um, contractors as well. Do you feel the pressure of obviously your family's legacy, but also being a black executive in the space of making sure that everything goes right? Because I feel like, and this is in business too, we don't, we don't get a second chance to make it right. Right. Like if we mess up once, you're out, you're tarnished forever. So do, do you feel that pressure? Every day, every day I feel that pressure. Like I feel we have to be better, um, you know, we have to be smarter. Um, you know, our people have to be on top of everything that they're doing. There cannot be slip ups. There cannot be mistakes. Um, and I'm just glad that over the last 15 years that our senior management, they understand that culture. And that's that's how we work. And, you know, that takes me to the succession planning, too. You know, succession planning is all about who's going to run the company, but then who's going to own the company. So there are two two parts of succession because I didn't know what my kids were going to do. Um, and so what would I do on the ownership side? But then how would I build a company to run, you know, beyond me? And and I've spent a lot of time dealing with my senior managers, getting the right people in the right places so that the company can run without me. And I have to say, my team is, is very good um, because I spend my time really going after very large projects. And then I do a lot of my PR work. Um, I do a lot of speaking engagements and the company runs extremely well without me being there. Um, and so that's another thing if I'm, you know, talking about succession is making sure you have the right people to carry the company on beyond you. So uh, what do you think? All right. Is it always going to stay family? Because some companies after a while, they still have the name, but they're not being run. It's not a family run company anymore. The right. family can still have control over it. They still have ownership. But there's nobody in the family that's actually like the CEO is not a family member. Do you foresee that possibly happening, or do you always do you think that always it has to be somebody that's actually on the bloodline running day to day operations like the CEO? 
Um, it could happen. It could happen that is not a McKissick uh, running the company. That definitely could happen. Um, it could be that a McKissick doesn't own the company. <laughs> <laughs> also, I you know I I built this company to I I, I took the baton right from my mother from my father and. It's part of my um, charge to make sure I give the baton to the right people. And, you know, I'm, I'm not going to make that mistake of just giving it to my kids and then forget about all the people who have made us who we are today. That's not happening. That's something that... <laughs> yeah, the, the, best, the best qualified person. The yeah. best qualified. And Kathy actually said that at InvestFest, and he was talking about passing the baton to the family member. It's, it, if the family member's not ready, they're not getting the baton. No. Or it could be a no. different family member. Or, or well, I was, maybe not your children, but it could be a different family member. It could be a niece or a nephew or a exactly. cousin or something like that. And I do have those in my family as well. Um, but again... How many of your family actually moment. work in the company? Uh, just my daughter, Daryl. That's it? That's it. Out of no nieces, no nephews, no cousins, anything? Mm -mm. Why, why is, is it a large, <laughs> it's not, it's not, is it a large family or it's not a large family? <laughs> Our family, it really isn't that large. Okay. I have a twin sister and I have an older sister. Um, I have a niece, one niece from my twin sister. She's just starting NYU. So it's early. You know, it's early. And then my other sister had two daughters. That's it. Um, but my oldest sister's grandson just finished architectural school. Okay. Is he going to work in the company? I don't know. The, he's going to get the same He's going to get the same <laughs> option. Listen, you can go out there, but I'm only supporting you if you come here. That's right. <laughs> you got it. You got it. You got it. It's, I mean, so so what's that like, right? As a I mean, obviously as a CEO and an executive, but also as a mom, right? You have this lineage of civil engineer, civil engineer, architect, civil engineer. And now you have somebody who wants to deviate from that plan. Yeah, it's hard to take, uh, but it's the cards I'm dealt. And, you know, I'm really good at not trying to make something into what it's not, just accepting, because the truth sets me free. Mm. So if I recognize it is what it is, then I can make a decision. I love making decisions. <laughs> <laughs> You, you, you take me as a type. <laughs> I'll make a decision. <laughs> so, okay, let's talk about Affirmation Tower. Okay. So yeah. this is a project. Um, if it's able to be completed, the only skyscraper in New York, which a majority black own ownership. Yes. And uh, all black, well, mostly black owned team as far as on the construction side, on a lot of different aspects of it. Don Peebles, leading in charge, um, the most successful black real estate developer in American history. Um, so you're going to come in as the construction on it. Is that correct? And developer. Oh, you're part of the development team too? Mm -hmm. Okay. So so you guys develop, you do, you do real estate development. Uh, I've invested in projects that I've worked on. Um, so a lot of times developers become contractors because they have all these, you know, real estate assets that need some type of maintenance or, you know, ref refurbishing or whatever. So they create comp uh, construction companies. And a lot of times construction companies become real estate developers uh, because, you know, they're taking on the, the biggest risk for a real estate developer is the construction and the contractor takes that risk. So, you know, as a contractor, you know, you're you're making 3% on a, you know, $200 million deal as opposed to the developer making 20%. <laughs> so, you start looking at that money and you're like, "Oh my god. This this, you know, math it would be better if I was on that side of the table." But Don, you know, I've been knowing for so long, um back when I was in college. And so Don had said to me for many years, like, you know, I really want you to come in on the development side. And so Affirmation Tower is one of the projects um, where he said, this is a good opportunity for you to be a partner in the development. So um, I think it was, CB, it was CBRE called me up. They said, we have this great uh, project with Site K 
at Javits, and we think Don Peoples would be the best developer for this project because we see a hotel there. Do you know him? I'm like, oh, yeah. Are you, are you kidding? Yes. I knew Don when he only owned his uh, efficiency. <laughs> <laughs> And so I called Don, and Don was already looking at it. And so CBRE and um, Don got together because CBRE, they do um, market analysis, which was very important as to what should be in the building. Um, and so they became a part of our team, and then um, Craig became the part of our team. And so it's Don, Steve uh, Whitkoff, who... I don't know, owns millions of square feet of real estate in New York, myself and, and Craig. So we're the owners. David Ajay is the architect. McKissick would be the contractor along with another company, Suffolk Construction. Um, and then it's all, MWBE, 35% all the way down the line. <laughs> it's a very exciting project. We just need to get it off the ground. Yeah, I mean, it speaks to the power of working together. Were there, I mean, obviously, have you worked together prior to that? Obviously, you knew each yeah, other, but um, you so, had projects prior? Yes. Um, so uh, downtown on Leonard Street, Don finished a residential building probably two years ago. We worked on that. Um, that's probably the first building owned by a black person south of 125th Street. Yeah. But there's not a skyscraper, and that's what we want to do. Okay, so all right, where does it stand right now? I know there's some challenges uh, politically. So where's it? What's the update? yes? Um, ESD uh, ended the RFP process back in December of 2021, um, and so they said they wanted to have more affordable housing requirements with the RFP. Um, so we are waiting for the RFP to resurface. Uh, so we can pursue it again. Um, you know, that that sits with ESD, the governor, and her team. New governor. As to what, yeah, yeah. as to what they want to do. So, so that, that's the, how the plan works. They say that they want more affordable housing. You go back to the drawing board with the team and say, how do we implement more affordable housing into it? And then we resubmit? Depending on what they have in the RFP. Okay. Yeah. Well, you know, Yes. I mean, you know, it might be that the affordable housing is goes somewhere else. I, I, I don't understand housing on, you know, 11th Avenue by Javits. Yeah. It's not a lot of amenities over there. It's like the wasteland. Yeah. But there's pressure. We need 800,000 new units of housing yeah. in New York over the next 10 years. Fit it in where they can get it. How yeah. important is it to be politically connected in, in dealing with, you know, politics? Like, you actually actively, do you stay neutral or do you back politicians? Do you support <laughs> campaigns? Do you go to, you know, to brunch and pay $10,000 to eat yes. caviar? Like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes, I do. <laughs> yes, yes, yes to everything? I would say for every project that I have pursued for my entire professional career, has a technical buyer and a political buyer. And if we can satisfy the technical buyer and the politics is going our way, then we have a better chance of succeeding. So that's everything we do. The technical, what's the technical buyer? They are the bureaucrats or they're the procurement team that looks at the proposal and says, okay, check. You have all the um, relevant experience. You have the great resumes. They're the ones that do that. The proposals, you know, well thought out and written. And they tend to make a recommendation to some higher up. <laughs> uh, and that higher up, um, in a lot of instances, it could be a, a political arm. So it's important to have good relationships with the politi politicians. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Governor, city council, mayors, all that. All of that. So across congressmen, congressmen, presidents. <laughs> yeah. So across all parties. Yeah, um, because also they're advocating for MWBE. 
you know, they, they, they may not say, I want McKissick to have this project, but they certainly can say, I want a firm of color to get this project. So how do you, all right. So this is interesting because it's a thin line between, it's a thin line between like paying somebody for favoritism and supporting somebody's political campaign. Like I remember when um, Hillary Clinton was running for president and I think it was Goldman Sachs, one of these investment firms, they had donated like, and I'm not a hundred percent sure on the number, but it's, it's around there. 18 million to her campaign, but they donated 17 million to Donald Trump's campaign. So they hedged their bet either way. They won, Mm -hmm. which is smart, but then how do you, then it's like sometimes like the mayor in Chicago that went to jail because I think it might've been construction. Like people were actually paying him money and he was giving jobs to the people that were paying him. So where's the balance in that? Well, number one is you don't pay to play, right? You don't pay a politician for a job. Well, you, you know? kind of are. So that's the, it, it kind of is being, it kind of, you kind of are paying to play. Like if you're supporting somebody's campaign a million dollars, it's kind of paying to play. But you're also supporting their agenda. Okay. And you know, their agenda, if their agenda isn't about MWBE, they don't get any money from me. So you're supporting an agenda and you're relying on that politician to say, when it comes time to make selections, I need, I need the team that has the most MWBE participation on it. Or I need the prime to be an MWBE. Um, as opposed to a politician who says they don't care about it at all. They'll accept a team that has no MWBE. So you're really supporting an agenda. Mm-hmm. So on, on the MWBE front, when you look at the landscape and you sometimes you're bidding against other firms, how many firms do you see um, in the landscape when, when you're going to, to, to try to get a project? Do, are you seeing a lot more? Or how does that look? It's still not a lot mm. um, that, you know, play in our space or compete in our space. It could definitely definitely be better um you know i i I don't, I don't know how many but we definitely need more and but it's growing i mean less than two percent of all contracts for the city of new york go to black women i mean that's a low number yeah but how many people actually forging that because i've heard stories in before where they have like a black person as the front face of it was well, really a white company or somebody's wife that happens <laughs> <laughs> that happens you know kathy hoko i think just passed the law um to kind of root that out like there's an an ig that you can call independently if you see it but people don't do it yeah this, I, I mean i feel like there's two sides to that right like if there's less competition from a business standpoint that means there's going to be more opportunities for your company true but on the other end at some point there needs to be more to have more representation so like do you feel a responsibility i mean you're already trailblazing you know, and obviously speaking on platforms like this and others helps people become more aware and hopes to aspire to become what you've become in the space but how, how, it's like a double edge right so how, how do you how do you battle that it it is and it isn't you know i I always bring other MWBEs on my projects. Matter of fact, for the school, I mean, for um, New York City Economic Development Corporation, uh, we have the highest MWBE numbers on our projects. Um, And so we train, we promote, we build capacity. um, And I know it sounds like a double-edged sword, the, the thing is, is just, there's just so much work. It's enough for everybody to eat. Mm. Um, and I feel that way. I just need everyone to be <laughs> professional <laughs> and provide the same level of services. Um, we got to get to Because we get, we get a broad brush. Uh, you know, when someone, one does something wrong, then we, you know, all of us. Yeah. It's like Kanye. <laughs> it's like Kanye. Yeah. yeah. No, it's true. No, they trust like true. every single person for what one person exactly does. 
Exactly. Well, they do that all the time. Yeah. But nobody else is held to that same standard. No. It's mm-hmm. like Sam Bankman Freed, like he didn't destroy it for every single like he took down twenty billion dollars in a day. I know. Nobody right? nobody's painting a brush for every Yeah, shut down Gemini. Yeah. <laughs> it's just like, you know. Doesn't work. Right. I mean, I saw we crash. He 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 walked away with a hundred million after, you know, losing all those people's money. Yeah. And a th- three week press tour. Um, you know, Hudson Yards got six billion dollars of taxpayers' money. And we can't get uh site K at Javits Center and we're not asking for these subsidies. Yeah. Before last question for me. How is the economic times affecting construction? Interest rates specifically, um, inflation. We're in a recession, even though they haven't officially announced it yet. How has that affected your business? Um I think it's going to affect it on the private sector side. You know, um, interest rates still may go up Mm -hmm. another point. Um, And so what I've heard from my other um, colleagues in the business that a lot of the private developers are saying, okay, we're, we're going to hold on our new developments. We're going to slide everything out for a year. Um, so that's detrimental to them because they probably have staff that they're ready to put on a new project. And now they that staff has nowhere to go for a year. Um, the other thing is the supply chain issues we're having. You know, the electrical gear. I mean, we're starting a new project for J.P. Morgan Chase in Wilmington. And to get our generators is 80 months. <laughs> 80 months. <laughs> um, and so what does that do? That delays the job. That costs more money. I mean, so it's it's a problem. It's a problem. And wow. what, about, what about the inflation? Because where the materials are coming from? China? No, our materials come from everywhere. All over the world? All over. So how yeah. is that inflation? is you're paying You're paying a higher price now. So that means that the job is going to cost more money to get done. Yeah. Correct. We pass it right on to our clients. Um, the other issue is insurance. You know, New York has the highest insurance when it comes to construction. I mean, exponentially higher than any other state because of the scaffolding law that we have. Mm -hmm. And now they're looking to impose even stricter laws with respect to, um, the scaffolding law, which would increase our insurances even more. Um, and so that cost gets bared by our clients. I mean, we we have to deal with it the first year, but the second year, you know, all those costs are in our numbers now and, and they go straight to our clients. And so construction, you know, becomes unbearable. So we're we're lobbying, <laughs> trying to make sure we can keep our insurance numbers down. Okay, so we, you said inflation, supply chain, but we didn't even say anything, the pandemic. And yeah, how, the effects that that's had, right? Because you couldn't even have workers on site, and so I'm imagining there's a back to like of what you were doing on projects. How do you catch up, or how do you even manage that? Well, fortunately, most of our projects were uh, deemed necessary. Okay. So maybe we had a couple of projects in Philadelphia and a couple of projects in New York where people couldn't go back to the site for six months. But most of our projects, we were back to work in about a month to two months, which is fortunate. Um, And then we did apply for the PPP loan. And, you know, we were able to get that something from the government for the first time. (laughs) It's supposed to pay taxes. (laughs) Uh, So let me, how technology, how have you embraced technology to, I'm sure that's changed in the last 30 years from when you first started to now. Yeah, and and our industry is notorious bad when it comes to technology. And everything we do is a big data problem, if you think about it. And so I think the technology is catching up. The problem is it's just so many different platforms. I wish it was just one platform, um, you know, that, that does the schedule another one that does the accounting you know another one does the inspection i mean the pre-qualification i wish it was just one platform where it all came together 
Um, there are a couple of contractors out there who are developing proprietary software to do just that. Um, it's a little big for us to do, but mm. <laughs> hopefully they will create something uh, where we have just one platform. Yeah, but if there's anything out there new, we'll try it. Yeah. Well, I'm thinking one day there's going to be somebody who's going to have the steel. Somebody's going to have the machinery. You'll have the construction. It'll be one universe. It'll be a clean cut. We have to. We have self-reliant systems for us to, to just develop whatever we want. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I feel it coming. It's coming. <laughs> it's coming. It's coming in the labor force too. Where yeah, artificial intelligence and robots. Um, what's your thoughts on that? I think that that's maybe not right now, but in the next twenty, thirty years, a lot of these construction jobs, the workforce is going to be cut dramatically because of machines and artificial intelligence and robots uh we'll see i you know i think if any impact that there's going to be that could have that drastic of a change like diminishing the number of workers would probably be modular you know engineer type stuff that's done um in a controlled warehouse that can you know be shipped to a site and stacked that i see uh, happening faster and and that it'll be a while before it happens in new york because everything is a specialty here <laughs> everything is the first time you've ever done it <laughs> uh you can't you can't get any redundancies to to really stack it it's red tape mm -hmm. so much red tape yeah, in new york. a lot of regulations you got yeah you got dom domestic obviously projects anything um from an international standpoint that interests you or, or you see on the pipeline down down the road well, let's see. I chased the Saudis <laughs> a few years ago. Uh, they were building about 10 soccer stadiums. And um, a friend of mine said, listen, Cheryl, I just want you to meet me in London. I can't tell you who you're meeting, but just trust me. And so I'm like, OK. And so, I, you know, it's like got to be there in 24 hours at such and such a time. So I do it. And um before I walk into the room, uh, the guy, my friend, he tells me, he said, you're going to meet uh, Osama bin Laden's brother, <laughs> Saad bin Laden. Really? So bin Laden is the largest contractor in Saudi Arabia. And I mean, to the tune of like a hundred billion a year. Wow. They were the king's um, builder. And so, you know, they, they did everything there. Um, and so they were looking to see how they could integrate with American companies to build um, these stadiums. And, you know, my first concern is I'm a woman. <laughs> like, you know, some days you couldn't even touch Saad. Mm. If he had on, you know, his, I don't know what you call it, the, the garb. The door. Yeah, whatever. That means he, he was a shake that day mm -hmm. and a woman couldn't touch him. But if he had on American clothes, you could shake his hand. <laughs> so I never I couldn't understand, you know, all of their regulations, but it was it looked like a really good opportunity. You know, they were paying our flights and everything to come over to, to talk to them. Um, but then the king died and then the oil prices dropped. And so they were losing money every day. Not that they didn't have a lot to lose. I mean, they it didn't matter to them. But I just got a little tighter. Yes. And then I don't know if you remember the struggle with MBS. And we had a whole conversation about this. Okay. Abu Dhabi, mm -hmm. the journalists, they got killed. Yes. yes. The yep. Shogi. Yep. 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 Yeah, we had a whole. Were you there when we had that conversation? Yeah, it was me, you, and Keys. No, no, no. Oh, 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 oh on the roof in Abu yeah, in yeah, yeah, yeah. Dubai. No, I wasn't there for that. Yeah, you wasn't there for no, that. No, 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 I wasn't there for that. We had the conversation about that yeah. conversation. Yes. In Miami. <laughs> we, got, we, got to, we got to talk off camera. That's off camera. <laughs> off camera. Well, their agenda changed. They, you know, they didn't know if they wanted to build the stadiums anymore. Dr. Zaire, who was my connect, died in a plane crash with Saad's mother flying into London. Um, and so it just all kind of fell apart. But... You know, what I realized in that is, you know, I probably wouldn't do that again. And I wouldn't do it again because I didn't have protection. You know, 
you know, it's a different culture. You, you can't open a business over there unless a Saudi Arabian is your partner. Um, it's just too many unknowns and too many risk. Um, and I'm, I'm not sure that I would do that again. And then I know companies who did, who didn't get paid. And again, I just come back to New York. I'm home. <laughs> 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 it's so much business. I'm telling you, there are clients that I can still tap into that I haven't. So it's enough right here. Yeah. It's enough. Else. It's enough. Make yeah. Make it here. Make it everywhere. Anyway, every, right. Everywhere. Everywhere. <laughs> everywhere. There you have it. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining us. This was uh, fun. Yeah, we completed Appreciate the trifecta. That. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Any, anything you would like, like any last words, any anything you would like to tell the audience at all? Um, let them know and black them. entrepreneurship um that's my passion you asked me about helping and helping mwbe firms recently we started legacy engineering that was in 1991 with a good friend of mine it's a mechanical electrical plumbing and fire protection design company um black owned me and my friend john rice and we started it with the whole purpose of creating entrepreneurship for black engineers. So we are scaling this company right now um, and we're bringing in engineers of color to eventually take over this company from us. Um, and to me, that's like the best. And I am so excited about this one. <laughs> <laughs> this is a real give back. Um, and so we're excited about that. And we've been extremely successful because there aren't any black owned mechanical, electrical, plumbing, engineering firms in New York. And just think about all that work out there and all the requirements out there. And then people like the goodwill that this company represents. So that's all I would talk about. I encourage everyone to be an entrepreneur. There you have it, ladies and gentlemen. Hey, we appreciate you. Yes. Yeah. Another classic episode. Yeah, trailblazer, for real. Yes, yes. <laughs> and probably one of the best dress guests we've had. Just, oh, just, gosh. Just, just thought I'd say that. Ah, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Damier. Thank you. Troy, any housekeeping items? Yeah, shout out to everybody on Patreon.com. Shout out to everybody at EYL University, powered by Recession Proof. The biggest just got bigger. Shout out to all of y'all uh, that are part of that community. I mean, it's, it's an incredible place to be. Uh, so shout out to y'all. Shout out to everybody supporting the merch. Shout out to the merch team, Bam. Uh, my boy, uh, Smitty. Love is love, y'all. Keep supporting. Yes, thank you guys for our comments. We'll see you next week. Peace. Peace. My graduates from my school being Forbes. Backdrop. Backdrop. <laughs> a mic drop. Backdrop. Backdrop. <laughs>